So this is Alex Hormozzi's work condensed as much as I can. Listen to at least 15 hours of content on double speed, which was quite a trial uh, to save you a lot of time. And just because I think this guy's good and I'm, I'm going to specifically apply it to coaches. Um, he, that's not his background exactly like life coaching. So some of it will need translating. Most of it, though, is just fantastic. Just really solid marketing advice. I think coaches can learn a lot from him. Obviously, those of you who are like yoga teachers and movement teachers, other things will just be equally relevant. I found uh, the funniest picture of him of I could for front cover. Excellent beard as well. Let's give him some points for his beard. Okay, um, just by kind of wave, who here has kind of seen his stuff already? Kind of some of you, right? Okay, so feel free to chip in if you think I'm missing anything. Uh, word of warning, this is going to be fast and furious today. This may even be worth listening to a couple of times. It's going to be very whiskey not beer very dense stuff um so great marketing advice condensed that's what's on offer applications his main point of view plus a few little little hacks but there's some key messages that i've drawn out from a load of youtube videos and his books that i think we could all learn from frankly um i kind of got onto him a he kept appearing on my youtube algorithm but b several marketing coaches that i really respected said wow this guy's stuff's good and uh, it's a lot of sort of killer and not much filler generally in his it's also that it's densely good it's not like you have to watch two hours of content to get one tip so it is dense to condense that even more is very dense um also another reason is you know most of you know by now i've had a fair bit of experiencing running businesses and you know charities and different things and this was very aligned with what i learned through the embodiment conference and through running uh, embodiment unlimited like I'd say like 80% of it was very, very aligned and 20% of it was just new and, and amazing. So um, there's also maybe a few things to avoid to look at, which I'll save till the end. On the end, I'll say like, you know, here's a few things you might want to tone down a little bit. Uh, a couple of things I took from and kind of got wrong, I would say. And we've actually one that we even tested that doesn't work. So um, yeah, I'll say why towards the end. All right. Um, his experience is fitness, did a lot of sales experience. I think this is one of the things that makes people excellent salesmen. It's just a lot of face-to-face -face embodied sales experience. Um, charity people have this, pickup artists have this, sales people have this. Not many other people do. That like constant embodied attunement in a sales sense uh, on the shop floor, as it were. And now he's got into sort of scaling and acquisition. So taking on other companies and helping them scale which is also really interesting because he had the personal embodied experience, but then he had this experience of seeing lots of other businesses. So some people who give business advice, you know, I have that in a way that I'm on the podcast, for example, right. Or I have all my mentees and like that mashes here today with her experiences. So we share notes. Um, some people who are very good at marketing one thing or one business, it doesn't, they haven't rounded that out. So their, their knowledge is just from one thing, which may or may not apply. Whereas because he's working with a lot of other companies through scaling them, I think he's got knowledge that's more generalizable. I managed to say that word. Uh, the other one is he's just good. Like it's very rare that I would spend this much time looking at someone. There's been others, Seth Godin, Rory Sutherland, um, you know, in terms of people who work with us, Tad and George. But um, he's one of the few that I'd bother spending this much time on, frankly. All right, let's talk about his embodiment. Ladies, here is a topless picture. Oh, uh, yeah, some of you are biting your lip and nodding. I thought a bit of eye candy would help us out. Um, I'm pretty sure that he's on some, as they call it in the industry, special, special food supplements. Okay, so my well beyond TRT or some sort of testosterone enhancing drug. Um, certainly a lot of experience weightlifting. Um, that, in, in either case, Energy levels very high, goal setting very strong, boundaries very good. And these are all three things he recommends. So doing a lot, having clear goals, and saying no to stuff. Um, if, has anyone here ever tried to boost their testosterone levels, like naturally or artificially? Sometimes women have to for their own sex drive or for, you know, hormones and stuff, for, you know, skincare even. Um, if you do that, these things will happen. You will become more Alex Hormozy. All right. I've 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 done it naturally. And you're just like, you come here. I want this. Like everything comes very goal directed. Also, your energy levels just go through the roof. Think of me at 25. For those of you who have known me a long, it's a terrifying prospect. Uh, it's calmed down a little bit now. So um, who does this apply to sort of naturally? Like, that's me. 
I'm a, you know, Mash has got some muscles. Sure, she muscles Masha. Come on. She works in fitness. Yeah. Some people are naturally, let's say, yang. Give us a wave. Who's a yang one? Danny's got a bit of that young man energy. Big set of balls on him. Tim, I think a bit as well. Ranko, he's he's Balkan, you know, so he he definitely he counts double. Yeah. So um, some of you, who's thinking that is definitely not me? Definitely not me. Well, I'm the yin, the, you know, more side. So that could mean you've got loads to learn here, or it could mean this is really not going to be my style. I, I would say don't discount, discount him completely. Yeah. In some ways, I probably shouldn't lean too hard into his work because it would probably just make me more neurotically me. Right. So it's uh, it reminded me of a younger version of me, certainly. Uh, he says, you know, all business is stressful. It's a certain worldview, right? It's almost a traumatized worldview, actually. And he's from a, a family of um, Iranian immigrants. So it could be a trauma thing there. I don't want to diagnose anyone. Um, but this idea, like, you know, he says uh, stagnating is stressful. Growing is stressful. Uh, staying the same is stressful. So all business is stressful. You know, that's a particular worldview, isn't it? It's a particular embodiment and way of being. Uh, there's some truth in it. Uh, but he also says there's money everywhere, which I think is a great, uh, it's a great abundant mentality, right? Like rather than being in scarcity, which is something else you find with some other traumatized people is there's always scarcity. So this idea is money is everywhere. I think it's just a fantastic rather than, ah, oh, I heard someone today saying, oh, but in Europe, no one buys anything. And, and it's the same everywhere. Wherever you go, people say, oh, that wouldn't work here. So is, is that a belief people have? There's money everywhere. I mean, people are spending money left, right, and center. Look around your room, right? Look at all the things you've spent money on. Electricity, your computer. This is a, you know, thousand pound MacBook Air or whatever, right? Your phone, you spend money on every week. Just look around. You're spending money continuously on all this stuff. And yet we say, oh, people don't want to spend money. Well, they will if there's value. Yeah. Interesting. We'll do Q&A at the end. So, or maybe halfway through. It's just hold on questions for now. Uh, this is, I wanted to start with this. This is Layla, his beautiful wife. Uh, and he often credits her. And I, I think even the most macho young guy constantly credits that he has a great partner. And it's not something you do alone. I know, for example, Chris Williamson regards him as a friend, you know, successful podcaster. He's networked with Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's his kind of fitness hero. Um, yeah, for me, even though he's kind of very young, there's no Sigma male here there's still a sense of being in partnership, not doing it on your own. I didn't want to miss that because I think people could miss the importance of the relational side with someone that has his style. Okay, uh, life hacks. This is not his main thing, so I'm going to go quite quickly through this. In many ways, he's like anti-life hacks. He's got videos on fuck your morning routine, for example. Okay, which is interesting because I Googled it a bit more and he actually has quite a nice morning routine of cold showers and different things. But he says, look, if you spent three hours on your morning routine, what if you just spent that time working instead? So he's not big on life hacks. And I would say, yeah, as a 35 year old guy on testosterone, maybe those of us who are 50 might look at that a bit differently in terms of health and well. But I certainly found that at 40, I needed to take my well-being much more seriously. Um, you know, that being said, he does little life hacks like he wears the same clothes every day, which was I think was an Einstein thing originally. Uh, I was trying to get a flannel shirt to wear for this presentation, but I couldn't find one. Um, he doesn't take set days off. He just rests when he's exhausted. But that's uh, really interesting. Um, he checks his bank account every morning, not his social media. I would, all my mentees, start doing that. Every morning, check your bank account, even if nothing's changed. I think it's just a nice mental shift. He talks about your environment and making things cueable, making time and focus for deep work. Have people heard this term, deep work? Like, what are you really focused on? Like, most of our work can be, oh, I'm just going to fiddle around on, you know, Instagram for a bit. And it's like, okay, is that really the work that makes the difference? I'm going to come back to that. And just little things I got from him, like he reads books while listening to the audiobook of the same book. Yeah, and it just can help it go in more. By the way, you guys have really helped me because listening to his stuff and then doing a presentation on it, such a great way to learn so thank you for uh allowing me to be your teacher once again okay um this is a key thing key key thing everything i just said is details just work harder that's the 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 title of his podcast with um chris williamson some of you are rolling your eyes and there are downsides to this right we can hit burnout we can hit exhaustion 
the fact of the matter is I don't know anyone who started a business who hasn't worked really hard, at least for some period in setup. Okay. And some, some of you listening to this are already pushing too hard. You should absolutely not listen to this. Most of you, however, are, you know, I think the average coach could probably do with the average work ethic of say the average scaffolder who gets up at 5. AM. Yeah. I scaffolders who were like, they're on site by 7. AM. Right. They work their ass off and they in scaffolding. That's just considered totally normal. Yeah. To work really hard. And it might be like work hard, then job done and go home at 3 p.m. Yeah. Go to the pub. But like that's a work ethic in a lot of places that I think we've lost. And there are risks here that I will come to. Uh, let me just do a quick, quick survey of you guys. This is something he says, said you should be doing marketing and sales for the first four hours of your day. Yeah. So what did you do for the first four hours of your work day today? So let's say you woke up, you had a shower, you meditated, great. You did your morning routine. Hopefully it didn't last three hours. Um, in the chat, if today was exceptional in some way, you can pick yesterday, but we won't go back further than yesterday. So what today or yesterday, what did you do for the first four hours of your day? Actually, tell me, look at your calendars, write it in the chat. Yeah. And then the question we're all going to ask ourselves is, is, was this critical for my business? So for example, I had a marketing meeting with uh, Steve and Leela, not his Leela, but my Leela, um, where we looked at the, what we how we're selling Keck, which is our most important course and brainstorm strategies for that. That was a good hour of my day, good use of my time. You know, Helen and I just met for half an hour to talk about LinkedIn, which is one of our new acquisitions um, funnels. That could be a really important thing for my business. Like these were good uses of my time. Yeah. So the first four hours of your day. And if you're thinking, oh, honestly, look at your phone, how much of it was fucking around? How much of it was doing non-essential things? Now, some of you have, you know, have to take my son to school, right? You have life commitments that he might not have. Yeah. So like waking up at 6 a.m. or, you know, doing this every day for four hours. Here's what I would say to my mentees. If you're expecting to make a business in coaching, which is a crowded market, there's a lot of coaches out there without doing a good few hours a day on marketing, I'd say, forget it. Yeah. And you might be like, Hey, I want to do the four hour work week and I want to work easily. Yeah, eventually. But in the startup period, I'd be very, very surprised if the minimum, I might even start having this as a criteria for my mentees is you do two to three hours a day, minimum marketing effort four days a week. If you want in on this course, because otherwise it's like, I just can't guarantee you success right? Like that's the sort of minimum involvement uh, to even have like a side hustle business, right? Yeah. I live in a place full of middle-class women who ha whose husbands support them. And I'm tired of coffee shops that are closed at 8 a.m. on a Monday. I'm tired of saunas that are closed on a Sunday. Uh, I'm tired of boutique shops that seem to sell nothing. Um, and it does seem to be gendered. I'm sorry to be sexist because uh, somebody else is supporting them. Yeah. Like, as my girlfriend said to me, I want you to make enough money that I can make cappuccinos at a loss. And I was just like, OK, darling, that's great. Thank you for telling me my life goal. Yep. So like I, that's not you, right? One or two of you, I think, have rich partners or trust fund money, but most of you don't. So you you need to be doing this, I would say. Some of you are like, and he's like, but I just had twins. OK, she's going to have to work even smarter to not work three hours a day. Yeah, so that you have to be better at marketing if you've only got one hour a day. Okay. You still with me? No one's got depressed? Masha, have you found the truth of this as a sort of old mentee over the years that you can't do one hour a week and expect success? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but what form of marketing is always my question. That is the question. So let's go into that. So um, work hard doesn't make sense unless it's work smart. So it's not just effort, it's a effective effort where are you getting the leverage yeah where are you getting the leverage um he suggests a few things for example like um he says you should be spending a hundred dollars a day on ads or doing a hundred cold outreach calls he's talking to helen about doing this on linkedin to message people yeah or make a hundred me minutes of social media content some of you are like i'm gonna make five instagram posts in 50 days i'm like no give me five today and then five tomorrow, and then five the next day. 
and then eventually you'll get good. He's a big believer in just getting good through quantity. Yeah. Well, I can make I can make 20 Instagram reels in 30 minutes now. Why? Because I've made about a thousand at this point. Like I'm getting slick at it and I'm still improving. You, can, you know, you can keep improving. Yeah. So here's three things he suggests, for example. But the key thing is always do an experiment. Those of you who are newer in your businesses and he might be speaking to do an experiment for long enough to see if it works or not. OK, um, the key thing he says is focusing on these main tasks and then doing a long enough experiment so you can see if it brings in people, you can get better at something. His big thing is one channel, one product. Imagine if we did that, Helen, of all the products we've launched over the years and we keep coming back to, let's just sell Keck. That makes 70% of our money. Yeah, what's our one channel Facebook ads? Now, we might experiment with a second channel like we experimented with LinkedIn at the moment, right? Or experimenting with YouTube. But most of you don't. I have five staff members. Most coaches are just doing it on their own. So I'd say for coaches, pick one channel that might well work. So your audience are there. That's the key thing. He's got a great video on um, which audiences are in which channels, like who's on LinkedIn, who's on YouTube, who's on Facebook, like more women on Facebook, more men on YouTube, YouTube. So is your audience there? And then get really, really good at that one thing. He says most people start new things and then quit before they get good at it. Okay, so this is key takeaway. I think with the mentee group, I'm going to start saying this. Tell me your one channel. Tell me your one product. And of course, I think there's a niching part before that where you experiment and try different things. He also says sell to the rich and charge more. You know, we've increased the price of Keck this year. We'll be increasing it next year. I don't think this is good advice for everyone, uh, but I see why he says it. It's better to have less better customers. There's always that one customer I let into a workshop for fucking free or donation rate who then makes a complaint and turns out to be a social justice muppet. Yeah. It's like, ugh, I'm tired of the skint customers. They're boring. Yeah. So um, I really get this. Though not for everyone. You can sell a lot at a small price. You know, um, Andrew Tate, for example, who I don't like in many ways, he sells to young men a, a cheap product, but he sells a lot of it. Yeah. Like that's another valid model. Um, his big thing is great offers. Again, this is key, key point. Pay attention to this bit. His whole, you know, his book series is a hundred million dollar offers. Um, why do you not want to be a commodity? So a commodity is something which doesn't stand out. Like, you know, when you buy milk, you just buy milk, right? Unless some of you fucking hipsters have organic, what is it? Raw milk or something like that. Why do you want to be hipster, organic, raw milk and not standard milk? Okay, put it this put it another way those of you who have got a partner why do you want to be special to them and women filter for this because they're smart okay why do you want to be special for them and not just another boy or girl same principle helen who's your competition for rick there isn't any competition exactly okay because you are you are his leela you rick and helen a gorgeous couple right there's no competition Danny, I met your wife. What was the chances of me, with all my pickup skills, stealing your wife? Zero. Zero. Because <laughs> she loves her sister, on the other hand. Let's not go there. Anyway, we'll edit that part out. My sister's got a crush on ethic. Um, so anyway, so she loves Danny and no one else, right? This is what you want. You want your you want to be in a market of one, your customer. Yeah. She's not like, oh, Danny's convenient or Rick's convenient, right? It's like, no, this is a person you would crawl through broken glass to get to be. You would pay any amount of money to help them, right? This is a market of one. And this is by far the best thing with your product. You're not competing with anyone because if you're competing, the way capitalism works is it makes the it makes it cheaper, 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 cheaper. And then the margins are tiny and the most efficient person stays in business, which is a horrible way to do business. So this is, guess what, niching. You've heard me say this before, right? You've heard Tad say this before. Yeah. Um, don't be a commodity. Be incomparable. Still with me? Did you get the romance analogy? So many customers. You want your customers to be like, I don't care that you charge three times as much as a coach. I want Mr. Embodiment. Yeah. Or I've been following your podcast for six years. Of course, I'm going to pay double for your course. I don't care. I love your stuff. Or, hey, you're the only embodiment coach trainer who swears and makes those kind of jokes. 
right? Like that's refreshing. That's the word I get a lot. Refreshing means they're not getting it elsewhere. Yeah. So you need to be that to your audience in some way. I'm going back to that. Uh, this is the other thing. What is value? So the way capitalism works and, you know, he's one of those like uh, immigrant families come from a worse place who's loves capitalism because he's done well with it. Yeah. You sort of see that in Mike Isretel too. Who I also adore. Um, people want this dream outcome, but they want it easier, faster and more certain. Yeah. So we sold more Keck places when it was six months long than when it was nine months long for the same price. You'd think people would say, well, nine months is better because it's more value, right? No, they want the same result in six months, which we can just about do. Yeah. So that's why it was an improvement to make Keck six months and not put it either side of summer. For coaches, this is what you're selling. I'll sell to people, you know, you'll get embodiment will mean that you'll get the same results quicker, easier. You know, like Alina adds a lot to our coaching courses by making it easier. Helen makes it easier for you. That's why it's great to have Helen here because you can just ping her and she'll give you the right thing. Okay. Why will a Zempic always sell more than fitness training? You know what a Zempic is? Wonder weight loss drug. My friend's on it because she's disabled and can't walk anywhere and she's got really obese. Yeah. So lifesaver for some people. It's going to be massive. Johan Hari wrote a book on it. Why? Because it's fucking easy. You put a needle in your leg once a week and then you're just not hungry. I had my friend around for dinner the other day. She ate like this much lamb and then went, I'm done. I'm stuffed. I couldn't possibly eat anymore. It's like me, I'm doing it the hard way, right? Because I'm virtuous, right? These these kind of triceps, they don't come easily, right? I'm sitting here going, I'm hungry and I'm having to have a diet drink when I don't want a diet drink. And oh, I've got to do some steps today and it's fucking hard work. Right. It takes loads of time and effort to do 15,000 steps a day and calorie deficit. And I like the weight training, to be fair, but it takes time. It takes energy. So are you say as a coach, how are you saving people time and energy? I'm saving you time and effort now. Right. Because I listen to all this Axe Hormosis stuff and I'm giving it to you in one hour in a way that's more relevant to you. Because I know you guys, I know examples to use, et cetera. Yeah. So that's value. That's why you pay for mentoring. Because I sit there on my, you know, doing my walks, losing weight. Okay, listening to Alex or Mosey. Good, good in the gym too, Alex or Mosey. You'll get you going. Make sense? Yeah. Are you thinking about your offers as coaches? How does your offer set, give people an ideal result? What's the result they want? What's the problem you solve? You've heard me say this, right? Sometimes people say, I do transformational coaching. From what to what? Island A, Island B, to use Tad Hargrove's language. If you're trans, who wants, I don't wake up and go, you know, I really want to be transformed into a frog. No, like I want some change, right? Like, you know, I want weight loss. I want to be married. I want kids, whatever the thing is you want. There's a few things I want. <laughs> okay, so, uh, oh, my deepest desires. Yeah, so what are you selling that's a change? What are you selling that's a, a problem you're solving? Yeah. Like who's got babies? Who's got babies? Hands up, got kids or had kids. All right. What if I was a coach? You said, I can make sure your kids go to sleep for eight hours. They don't die and they wake up happy. How much would you pay me for that? Like, like a million squid, right? Or what if I said, oh, but I'm a, um, a, a parenting coach and I work with nurturance and I use attachment theory and gentle parenting. Nobody cares. Yeah, like nobody cares about what you do. They only care about the solution. You with me? All right. So what's the problem you're solving? How can you make it quicker, easier, less sacrifice? Hence, a Zempic is a great product. He gives the example of like meditations a less good product than Prozac or a, um, actually it's one of the anxiety drugs the Americans take. Yeah, because it's quicker. It doesn't mean it's better, but it's, you know, in some way it's a better product. It's easier to sell. There's a reason pharmaceutical companies are selling anti-anxiety drugs and not meditation or nature, for example. It's hard to package. Yeah. And no reflection on that. Okay. Um, he also talks about before you make sure you've got a great offer and a great product, which is one of the main things you should take from him. Look at the market you're in. So let's say I was selling embodiment VHS cassettes. I was really good offer, really good salesman, great product, but what's the problem? Some of you kids are like, what's a VHS? 
well, how do I explain that to young people? It's like a hard drive that goes in a TV. I don't know. So, um, yeah, that's just not a market anymore, right? And there was a time when Blockbuster was renting VHSs on every high street, and then the market just went through. You know, one of my concerns is the market for online training Give you know, post-COVID. Actually, here's what happened. It went up during COVID, went down, and then leveled out. Yeah, so now the market's more stable. But that was a big, you know, I made a lot of hay when the sun shined during COVID. Had to go to China, had to eat a wombat, had to spill do a lab leak. It was a nightmare. But what it meant was I made great money from the embodiment conference because that was peak market then. I made the mistake of thinking that market would last forever. Now the market stabilized, I can stabilize my business. Yeah. Is there pain? Is there money in that market? Here's one. Why should you not sell coaching for chlamydia victims? They need help. Embodiment coaching would help them. Stress management would help them. They're not connected together. There are, there are Facebook groups for people suffering from sleep apnea. There are not Facebook groups, I'm guessing, I don't know, um, for people studying. I should have chlamydia by now, but I don't. I'm surprised as much as you. Okay, there's no justice in the world, guys. Um, no, I've been a good boy the last few years. Um, so there's no like Facebook groups. There's no organizations. There's no National Chlamydia Association, right? There are associations for, say, doctors, or student nurses, or, you know, uh, people who are too nice. So they are networked in some way. Yeah. Is the group growing? Like people pleasers is a growing identification. So that's a good niche. I was suggesting to one of my Italian students that they literally just take everything I've done on people pleasing, translate it into Italian because the Italian market's a bit behind the British one. And oop, there's their niche right there. Literally, all they'd have to do is buy the rights off me for my people pleasing book, translate it, translate the email sequence I use that we know is successful already. We have a successful email sequence on people pleasing and they literally could have a whole new business. Right. I don't, I don't teach in Italian, so I'm, it's not competitive to me. You know, if they um, in writing agreed that they would only do their work in Italian, I would give them that sequence. Whole new market because it's behind and it's going to be growing because it always is. Anyone a translator here? Coaches? Yeah, yeah, like Masha does. What do you do? You do Luxembourgish, Croatian. You could take anything that's got a popular in America. Let's take attachment theory. That's so hot right now. And translate that into Croatian in two years' time should have a great audience. Yeah. And you don't need millions and millions of people in coaching. You need like a thousand people. So totally valid if any of you want to rip me off in Slovenian or whatever. I'll never know. Okay. Still breathing? It's pretty quick, isn't it? It's a little bit homozy style today. Um, here's what he also says, though. If you make an offer that's just amazing, you can be shit at marketing. Yeah. I'll give an example of this. Josh Shry uh, has one funnel. Um, he does courses on, uh, he does an amazing podcast. That's one funnel that's just so good that he then hardly has to sell it. Mash and I have both done his courses, right? It's like a brilliant course brilliant funnel he doesn't really need a lot of marketing he just like a couple of times a year on the podcast says oh anyone want to buy my stuff yeah you'll get a lot of word of mouth hit on this it's hard to start a business by being good with crap marketing you can get away with sort of okay marketing if if what you do is amazing yeah and i and we're always trying to improve keck because it's like i'd rather improve keck than improve my marketing make sense like, which is more effective, having the best chat-up lines or being the most marriageable, amazing, wise, kind, good-looking person in the world? Like, which is more which is more effective, right? It's like, I met a guy the other day, I was at Danny's wedding, right? This is what I do for my mentees. And there was a guy in the sauna who was a pediatrician doctor who weightlifted for a hobby and had great social skills. Ladies, line up, right? It's like literally a, a child surgeon with massive muscles and just really friendly. Oh, and he's a Christian, so he's got really good morals and values and won't cheat on you. I was just like, for fuck's sake, mate, you know, you're wasted on being Christian. Huh? Right. He was like, what were you doing when you were my age? I was like, drugs mostly. Um, okay, so the, it was 25. The v valley of despair is where you constantly try new things. Don't spend the time getting good at them. The valley of despair is when you go, I can't make the Facebook ad works or I can't get Instagram to work. And then you switch to the shiny new thing. Yeah. Who's done that before? All right. Instead of going, we have Keck Funnel, we do Facebook ads. Let's get really, really dialed in at that. You do something new, 
You do it more if it's successful. Dial in on what you're best at. Try more of what you're good at. Do it better until you're the best at it. Maybe then if you're making a million quid, do something else. This is all Alex's stuff, not mine. I've learned this the hard way. He's absolutely fucking right. Any of you like me who like to do a million things, I, I now have a compromise to this. It's called my shiny, it's called my side chick. Uh, Feral philosophy is my current side chick, okay? Uh, you want one thing that you're like deeply committed to, but you kind of get a hobby. I made the mistake with this Ukraine work of making it too much of my business, too much of my time and energy. Yeah, now it's 20, 30% of my time and energy. Most of my time and energy goes on the main project. Okay, makes sense? Yeah, so you're allowed a little bit on the side. Mark said it's okay, but mostly you should be doing the thing you're already good at that you can become the best at. Like, I'm known internationally for embodied coach training, right? It's like that. I wrote the fucking book on it, literally. Like, why am I not doubling down on that? <sighs> ADHD. Okay, pain point selling. Um, yeah, there's lots in this, but it's, it's it's got lots on sales. He talks about objection handling in sales. He's got a four-hour sales video that's pretty good. I actually made a mistake with this. I'll come to it at the end. Um, referrals, when to ask people to say nice things about you is at the is during greatest satisfaction. So that's why I'm going to ask you guys to say nice things about me at the end of this webinar, because I'm hoping you'll go, Mark, that was amazing. Thank you so much for all the work you did. Yes, I'll happily say something nice about your mentee program. Yep. So it's like he gives the example, when's the best time to ask for a restaurant review when you just fed them a steak? OK, when's the best time to sell when they're hungriest? It's the opposite. When people are you want that point where people are suffering but haven't found a solution yet. Yeah. This is what people buy. Health, wealth and sex it's kind of relationships. If it's for their kids, obviously, it's just the first two. Yeah, this is what people buy. So if you're not selling directly to one of these, it's tricky. It's tricky. The best embodiment programs I've seen are things like um, nervous system health for a chronic pain. Yeah. Like you guys as mentees, a lot of what you're buying is wealth, right? You want me to help you with your business or it's relationships, improving your marriage. It doesn't have to be literally sex, but you know, it will stick in your mind if I say it. And I, someone actually wrote a book on this. <laughs> That's what people buy. So one funnel, one product, get great at it. Have I put that message in enough? If you're brand new, you don't need to dial it in yet. You need to do experiments. I think he misses that because he's not working with so many new people. He's working with scaling big businesses that are already going. So what is our one thing? Keck followed by mentorship. It's kind of like one journey. What's our one funnel? It's Facebook ads. Currently, we're getting great at it. And then we're trying some things elsewhere just to experiment. But I realized like, shit, I've got to get really, really good at Facebook ads. Not good enough. We've got to get, you know, Keck, we're already making really, really good as a product. And then it's like, what's the warm up sequence? Maybe it's Instagram. We need really, really good Instagram to build the um, trust with people ahead of Keck. So make sense? Is anyone who thinks they've got theirs dialed in already? They know what their one product is. Masha, have you narrowed it down? I mean, my one product is my, interestingly, Hormozzi's school platform. <laughs> so I now have all of my offers on his platform. Oh, okay. So that's your one um, channel is his school. What's the one thing that you're offering though? Right. I mean, it's a whole, the whole thing is basically sold because all of my courses are on it. Do you have a specialism that you can double down on? Yes. I mean, the one-on-one -on -one coaching, but that doesn't feel scalable. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. This the scalability is an issue there, but in terms of for what though, is it like your sleep work, for example? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all just sleep, uh, sleep coaching, Great. sleep related. So yeah. before well, you did mentoring with me, you didn't have that, right? You were doing lots of different movement, this and different that. And now yeah. it's just given to you. I was, I was wondering what happened there because I hadn't spoken to you in a while, but it's like, no, of course it's all sleep stuff. It's like, yeah. that's what I do. I help people sleep better. Yeah, yeah, sleep and dreams. Yeah, I thought that was obvious. Sorry. <laughs> great, great. So you see, for her, that's like a given now. Those of you who are new to mentorship, that was two years of hard work for her to get to that point. I, I think this is Tad's niching spiral. It's not just like she one day sat down with me and I was like, oh, yeah, here's your niche. She was like, great, thanks, Mark. Right. Sometimes it's like bolt of lightning. You know, we had one mentee do that with me once. But generally, it's like it's a process. You had to narrow it down, right? Uh, all right. Thank you, Masha. Um good knee slapping that's some of you need knee slapping it doesn't it m works better in american accent because it's niche slapping get it get it niche slapping yeah it works it doesn't work as a niche um english accent more into it. some of you 
a better off Tad's way of doing this, which I'll come back to, very different style than Alex's. I think it's not a matter of, I mean, he says something interesting, which is you can just choose your niche and get better at it. We have this sense of finding life purpose, but in some way you create life purpose. Like at some point I just decided to do embodiment, right? There's a bit more to it than that. Kaizen, continuous improvement. That's definitely part of his philosophy and continuing to get better, not pivot into something else. Sometimes you need to pivot, like Masha pivoted from movement coaching to sleep coaching. You don't need to do that most of the time. And if you haven't really seen, like if you're a blockbuster, you need to pivot, right? Okay, that, all the dead businesses didn't pivot when the technology changed. But most of the time we need to push. The language again is very yang, isn't it? Push rather than pivot. So I think it's a good takeaway. Uh, There's a good example from him, right? He's shit hot at YouTube. These are his YouTube thumbnails. I have been studying this intensely for the last month, so I know what he's doing. Um, things like the color of the copy. Yeah, how many words there are on there. Um, the fact his see his face here is surprised. That's a thing for YouTube. They like human faces, not bodies. Um, there's just psychological reasons why and surprise or some sort of gesture like him putting his finger up there intense eyes this is like classic youtube thumbnail making now um he says the headlines 80 percent of the work so in terms of like your sales pages your posts youtube thumbnails like we spend now at least an hour looking at the thumbnail that on a 10 minute video yeah, trying to make it optimize here. Yeah. I might even be forming a group of people just to compare thumbnails on WhatsApp. So getting rich is easy. So they're either curiosity ones or they're offers. Why 2% succeed and 98% don't? That's curiosity. This is copywriting expertise you're seeing. Copywriting is such an undervalued skill. Uh, and another thing he does is he buys expert advice. So I just said to Helen, Helen, you're doing my LinkedIn. Can I pay $500 for half an hour of someone's time to save you time to do that yeah so this is a really good use of your money is to find the top person in the field like if you're studying to be an embodiment coach you're in the right place right to find someone top notch and buy their time even if it's expensive because that again saves you huge amounts of learning this is effectively all an entrepreneur does all an entrepreneur does is learn something really really well and they take other people's learning and either employ those people or learn it themselves you with me? What's the one skill if I was to take the top person in the world and bring them here for you to learn? Don't say oral sex, okay? What is the one skill that I say, you know what, I'm going to get the top person in the world to give you a half hour lesson. What would that skill be? In the chat, what's the one skill if I said the top guy in the world? So for me, right, thumbnail creation, I would pay like at least a thousand pounds for 10 minutes with the top person in the world on that like right now I'd, I'd put that put my hand in my pocket right now for that yeah killer video editing right so i could recommend someone that could help you with that masha for example but like if it was like the top top expert i mean this is one reason i have a podcast and i keep my um secret cabal network full of people whose names you will never know um is um that I can find that person much, much easier. That's so valuable. Like I just asked a friend of mine from my secret cabal network, um, whose name I can't know, but has a big email list and you might know them. Um, like who's your top Facebook ads person. He just told me like that could have saved me like hours of recruitment time. What is the top skill? If you don't know what that top skill is, then again, we're looking at it in terms of, um, you know, figuring out your marketing, dialing it in. What's that one thing you need to do? Yeah. All right. Oh, still breathing. Everything he says is data driven. He's big on data. This is a Star Trek reference. If you don't know this, you're not a geek. That's fine. Um, and on no data, data is cute, isn't he? So big one is he's just like, show me the numbers. I'd say as a critique, he's almost too much on this. He's like, intentions don't matter. Intentions don't exist. He's almost like a behaviorist in terms of psychology. It's all about behaviors. McKinsey are like this too. They're like, show me the numbers. And there's a lot of truth in that. Like, you know, someone will be working for me and I'll say, okay, but how many emails did you get last week? Because emails is what makes my business run. That's my focus. And then we realized, oh shit, it's not emails. It's emails who buy. 
okay so how many you know what's the size of my list 171k i can tell you that accurately to a thousand um because it's an important number but what's the size of my list of people who have bought something it's 10,372 okay and i check that every week yeah it's literally that is the exact number so why is that important to me because that's the most important piece of data just measuring something goes a long way this is why I say to you guys, what are your numbers? You've got to dial that in. Make that number better and better and better. Classic one, scarcity and urgency. He talks about this in sales. Our audience don't like this if it's too pushy. I'll come back to why, but that's just if you're missing scarcity and urgency in sales, you're missing the most important thing. As a coach, you need deadlines. You know, I knew, I knew a meditation retreat center owner, and he told me, even like Buddhists won't book on a meditation retreat unless there's an early bird rate, which creates urgency. Uh, scarcity, 10 places left. This doesn't have to be forced or fake. You know, you can be like, literally, I only want to take on 10 people at a time to my mentee program because it's just too much for me to do all the induction calls otherwise. All right. Urgency starts tomorrow. That's urgency. It's not, it's not fake. We sell a lot of places the day before, of course. Okay. Something else he says, advertise more. I keep hearing mentees say, oh, I'm really scared of putting it out there. Out where no one knows you fucking exist. Yeah. Like you might think you, like nobody knows who you are. Like um, the embodiment conference, biggest embodiment event ever. Half a million people booked in that I did. Right. I remember going to a conscious dance event the week before and saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm doing this thing this week. Wish me luck. I'm pretty stressed. And I said, who, I said, who knows what it is? And we've been heavy. We spent a million dollars on Facebook ads. I shit you not. Okay. And still only like 20% of the hippies in conscious dance knew it was happening. I was like, for fuck's sake, you know, like, like that was not saturated. Afterwards, I realized I could have spent 5 million and saturated it. I just couldn't get the cash flow. Yeah. Mm. Customer service. It's not just about getting new customers. It's about retaining them. This is why I go the extra mile for you guys, you know, that are my mentees. I want you to keep subscribing to the mentee program. You know, I jump on extra one-to-one -one calls. I help you out. Why? Why will I go the extra mile for you? I mean, aside from you're nice and, you know, Danny's got fun friends to sit in the sauna with at his wedding. Uh, it's also just that like, I want you guys to stay around, right? And I think our customer service in my company, uh, for technical reasons mostly, not mostly Virginia's fault, has been a not ideal, Lovely as Virginia is, because mostly some of technical stuff, and that has really damaged our company. It was having like email problems, so people can't communicate with us and stuff like that. And I now realize it's not a small thing. How's your customer service? Your customer service is probably you, right? If you don't have a department, how quickly do you get back to people? Right, because but if it's a week, they're probably solved. If you if they email you and say, "Hey, I'm looking for a uh, um, yoga therapy," you leave it a week, they've found someone else, haven't they? It's too late. Yeah, it's like pick up the phone that day. Ignorance debt. I love this about him. He talks about um, return on time investment and the 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 biggest debt we have. And he's got a weird way of framing it that it's like a debt to the universe. Is why you're not making a million pounds a day because you don't know certain things. Yeah, we're born with this ignorance debt. Is how he looks at it. The biggest cost you have is not knowing how to make money. Okay, and there's a sort of urgency to his way of looking at it. All right, I'm going to do Q&A in a minute, so start getting ready for those. Four mistakes from a business. How many of these do you, do you have? Put a number in the chat. Not knowing your ideal customer. Charging too little. Operational inefficiency. That's the stuff like the customer service, the leaky bucket. One I made, over-expanding too quickly, too many channels, too many products. Fucking hell, did I make that mistake after the embodiment conference? Oh, my God. People tried to tell me I was too cocky. <laughs> How many of those are you making? Expanding too quickly doesn't necessarily mean employees, though it could. You know, my payroll was 150K a month at one point. Now it's 30K. And we do most of what we used to do, 80-20 rule because of efficiency. Um, it's even just like trying too many social media platforms. That's overexpanding, yeah. Oh, there's so much other stuff he says that's good. Social proof is great. Do epic shit. I've done some epic shit. That really helps with your brand. Have one huge offer just as a price comparison point, even if you never sell it. Yeah, we used to have an everything everywhere all at once, $10,000 offer, right? Yeah. He's got good advice on how to change an offer. Repeat yourself on social media. Helen recycles my content. 
so much good stuff okay criticisms criticisms what do you think what might not be perfect about alex's work i don't want to be a hater because he is very very good and i'm learning a lot but what might not be ideal or not ideal for you let me tell you a story he says guarantees are amazing he's got a whole chapter in his book on guarantees steve what happened when we a b tested our sales page of guarantees versus no guarantees after one of our friends told us that it didn't work for them what happened steve yeah, twice we tested them. Both times the guarantee page worked a lot less well than the non-guarantee page, as in conversions to sales. So we're A-B testing things. We're data-driven, which he recommends. But our audience see a big guarantee thing, and it looks spammy to them. Our audience are what in Spiral Dynamics is called green or level six, or we could say um, world-centric value set. I'll do this another time with mentees. Um, it's Ken Wilber's work, if you know it they don't like pushy American sales tactics. So I Ted Hargrave and George Cow, it's marketing for hippies. They've got a whole separate brand. It's trauma sensitive marketing. It's I made this mistake. I used one of his objection handling techniques while trying to upsell someone from Hungary to Keck, from Keck to mentorship. I genuinely thought they'd be a good fit for it, but I they gave me an objection like, hey, I can't do it right now. You know, I haven't got time. And I tried to use Alex Hormozzi's objection handling. Maybe I didn't do it well, but they're immediately just like, fuck you, stop being pushy. Why? Because they're Hungarian, not American. Americans have got a much higher threshold for being sold to than Brits, Germans, East Europeans too, Masha. We don't like it. So some of this stuff, if, if your audience is a bit hippie, co coaches often is, it's more if you're like a business coach, some of his stuff I'd say would work well. So that value set's really important. Some of you just aren't, you know, 35 and full of testosterone. So just do more is not necessarily great advice. However, this work smarter is, so let's not be too critical. Um, yeah, it's a bit hyper-masculine. Sometimes that's America. Fuck yeah. Um, sometimes I sort of think, what's he making money for? If he's got all these millions, I'm like, what's it all in service to at this point? Do you know what I mean? Is it all just a sort of big competition? Like, I don't quite get it, given that he's working incredibly hard by the sounds of things. And I believe that by his whole kind of drivenness. I sort of go, you know what? I'm not, I think I'd be more interested in quality of life at that point, right? I mean, I can certainly see the advantages of having some money, but it, it's not the only point in life. And I think he's service driven too, so I don't want to slag him off. Speaks a bit quickly, right? I mean, I've been very much in his style presenting this, by the way. That was my intention was to sort of do it in his kind of almost his energy. Yeah, muscle for muscle's sake. Like, why? Like, I don't want to be any more muscly. I've got friends who are more muscly than me. I mean, you know, come on, ladies. Yeah. But it's like, I feel strong. I'm healthy. I'm aesthetic. Like, if I got more muscle, it's just uncomfortable, actually. It's not going to help my sleep apnea. It's not going to, you know, my girlfriend's not going to find me more attractive beyond a certain point, right? Actually, she might find me less attractive. So it's like, why would I be doing that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Still breathing? What's your big takeaway? Wait, what's the one thing you're going to take away? I want everyone to take away like one gem. Honestly, his stuff is so loaded with gems. You know, his books are good. His YouTube's good. Podcasts. Well, I was writing down every second thing he was saying, so I don't want to slag him off. Just be a little bit cautious culturally and in the coaching world compared to, you know, the gym world. It's very much like achievement orientated level five. So it's a bit different. Big offer if not planned to use. Yeah. Look at his stuff on offers. Like what makes a good offer? Tad's got an another version of that that's well worth looking at. Tad Hargrave, he's got like 10 things that make an irresistible offer. Yeah, four hours marketing a day, or maybe that's one because you've just got, twins yeah but like like uh, like if you're not putting the work in i just go like, why are you here why are you here i guess it's gonna look different depending on health and energy and all the rest of it right mm. good yeah tech value slide a very good version from tad it's a more hippie version triple down on marketing yeah great get good at one thing <laughs> just work harder yeah dangerous message though isn't it for some of you <laughs> some of you need it Good. And obviously, you know, looking after his physical health, I think that gym world that he came from of fitness, you know, does lead into having high energy levels, right? And he's ADHD as fuck like me. So that's another thing. Good questions before Steve gets his social proof from you. Are you feeling satisfied 
and happy customers that I did this. Honestly, I don't want to trump fucking blow my own horn, but there's a lot of fucking work that went into this session. Uh, not every session's quite this dense, by the way, if you're visiting. If you want to join us regularly, they're a bit more chill than this, but usually I'll spend a two or three weeks researching someone and then I'll try and give the best of it. Solution is the most important. Yeah, big takeaway. Questions, mentees, particularly current mentees first. One great product. What's the problem you're solving in one of those areas? Yeah, the embodiment coaches who are working on, say, chronic pain, they they make more money than me. Yeah, like, like Irene Lyons stuff on trauma and chronic illness does well. And people pay a lot of money with her workshops. Hmm. Questions? Just got a couple of minutes. You can always WhatsApp me if you think of them afterwards. Mentees as well. That as ever is open. Uh, guests, if you want to join us regularly, message Helen, message me, get in touch. I think, you know, we, these sessions are a lot of value. Is one-to-one -one coaching a product? Uh, yes, but for who? What's the problem it solves for who? That's the key niche piece, right? There's other ways to niche. Like there's one massage therapist who works on the weekend in Froome. Yeah. You know? Like that's an issue, the fact that she's willing to work on a weekend. Mm. Do you feel a bit overwhelmed? No, not too much. Hope you've all got some good takeaways. Very solid stuff. As someone who's researched a lot of marketing people, he's definitely in my like top five now. If you want a counterpoint, someone else I did a class on recently could do for the mentee group um, would be Rory Sutherland, who's very sort of poetic and British and interesting psychologically. Alex quotes him sometimes, actually. He says he talks about, for example, value is not what it seems, right? Like, how would you make a train journey quicker? You can make the technology quicker or you can have supermodels giving everyone free wine on the train. So it seems like they want the train journey to last forever. Or you can have a notice board that says, here's when the train arrives. So you're not waiting forever. Uber does that. So it's psychological time. So the value things, not quite as simple as you might think. Yeah. A European one, Rory Sutherland, Seth Godin, I think is a bit more Euro aligned. It's one I'd recommend as well. They're like two, they're like three of my top boys. And then like Tad and George for the slightly more alternative market, right? But I know George, for example, George Cow, K-A-O, very good, uh, likes this guy's work. Thanks, Steve. Uh, ads work, it needs to be targeted, depends on the ad frequency, but basically they work. Like it's scalable if you get good at it. All right, Steve would like to get some social proof of you. Uh, if anyone would like to say what they've gotten from, what are you doing, Steve? Keck or mentoring? Yeah, keck or mentoring, both. Okay, uh, one sentence is ideal. What you got, so not it was great, but something that was like, I got from A to B, I'm able to do this, not just generally it was cool. That's the island A, island B thing. Um, if you're willing, one sentence, authentic, no bullshit, um, whatever you like. And if you want to put your name by it and location, then Steve knows you're given permission to do that in the quote and he can take that away. Uh, social proof is very, very helpful. Ah, good. Yeah. Could be a factual thing like Danny, like you made enough money to finance your own wedding as a result of doing coaching, right? Like, it's like, that's a, like huge fucking thing. Hope you don't mind me saying that. But uh Yeah, I can say that. Like that that's like way more concrete, right? It was like I was planning a small wedding, uh, and then I made some money and didn't have to, and it was great, you know? Uh it was a good wedding. Mm. Yeah, and uh, social proof, it's like recorded that I say it now or uh, how do you collect the social proof uh type it in chat if you're happy to okay i mean you could do one a video if you want i'm sure we could clip the recording but it's up, no pressure like only if you want it like zero pressure like that's an example of like hippie marketing right like zero pressure right like that's really important with our audience and it's maybe not so much within sort of you know american fitness world yeah just be like hey it's no big deal either way or make it authentic that's really important to me values wise as well right Hmm. Who's done Keck? 
Well, that'd probably be a generally we have no problem getting quotes from this, but we like lots of them. Like Steve, I want a thing people click on. It's just like a whole page full of social proof, you know? Like well, actually, a... just a fun one I discussed today, which maybe people you're in, interested in is talk to the web designer. We're getting someone else to sort of update our kick page, like I posted graphics in the chat. And she was like, oh, you have lots of testimonials, lots of social proof. I might spread them out throughout the page, not just one big fucking thing that oh, you click nice. arrows on, but little bits throughout the page. So that sort of thing, if you have quite a few, you can do that. And it emphasizes different points from us with other people's authentic feedback as well. Yeah. Okay. So if you're still typing, unfortunately, I've got to go teach in 30 seconds. So um, stick it in or text Steve or text me later. Okay. Maybe Helen can put a reminder on the WhatsApp group for people. Okay. ETK in 30 seconds. Is it on the same link? Different link? I've got to go. Thank you, Tim. Much appreciated. All right, let's take a deep breath together. Thank you, guests and visitors. Thank you, everyone. Good stuff. Cheers, Masha. Nice to see you again. Bye.